On this episode of China Unscripted, the human rights abuse that even Amnesty International wouldn't touch. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang, and I'm Matt Ganesha. Are you ready for another lighthearted topic on China Unscripted? Too bad, because today we're going to talk about the exciting practice of organ harvesting. That is, the Chinese Communist Party has created a system to kill dissidents for their organs and then sell those organs to rich people who want organ transplants. Joining us to discuss this issue is the Honorable David Kilgore. He's the former Canadian Secretary of State for Asia and the Pacific, a former Parliament member, and a criminal prosecutor for almost 10 years. Now he's a human rights activist, author, and one of the foremost researchers on organ harvesting in China. Thank you for joining us, David. It's good to be with you, Chris. I just hope that I can make everybody laugh with this topic. Well, I'm, a, I'm actually a, I, I'm one of your biggest fans. I, I don't know how you manage to be funny all of the time, it seems to me. And, and you must have very good writers, but you admitted that. So it has nothing to do with you whatsoever. It's just apparently it's it's a Shelley that, that writes. N- n- now, now, hold on. Like I feel I feel I need to correct uh, some inaccuracies in your statement. <laughs> yes, I am funny all the time, um, but that, that's not all, Shelley. I do, I do. Uh-huh. Shelley plays a part, a oh, big okay, part. Okay, all right, all right. But, you all right know. then I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw part of that statement. Okay, all right. Uh, over but you, overridden, but overruled. What do they say? All right. In courts. <laughs> yeah, Chris okay. was not a prosecutor for ten years, <laughs> but I played one on TV. Um, Anyways, David, please. Uh, I think I interrupted your introduction. So. Well, no, no. I, I'm. Uh, I've uh, been around a while. I have to admit, and I've. I've. Uh, I've been in something like fifty countries on this issue now. Uh, with David Matus, the two of us, and Ethan Gutman have traveled around the world a lot. And so there's basically no question we haven't been asked either rudely or politely, and uh, we've. Uh, we think we've. We know we have to be precise if we make one little error like the other day i i said that if you divided sixty thousand transplants a year in china which is our absolute minimum from our update which we did and documented very very carefully in 2016 uh, you come up with 150 people a day are being killed for their organs and thank goodness i was corrected on that because uh from any victim you can take obviously a lot more than one organ but as i hope all your listeners know you most organs won't last very long especially the vital ones like the heart and so on so so uh, yes you can take you can perhaps transplant more than one organ from a, a murdered so-called donor but um, but it's uh, it's not much it's not many organs will you can use from any one donor because there isn't a, a patient waiting to have a heart and another patient waiting to have a lung at the sort of particular moment that the that the person is killed for their organ. So it's uh, I'm, we clarified that carefully, and, I, and I'm very glad that uh, that's been clarified by the independent uh, tribunal, which is considering this matter. Okay, because organs basically only you have a narrow like it's we're talking hours here to get it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So unless there just so happened to be somebody who needed a heart and a liver at the exact same time would be unlikely that one donor, quote-unquote donor in this case, uh, would have the heart and liver used. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So and, big picture, so it's, it, po- it's possible that it is uh, one organ is one death. It's a well, possibility. Yeah, it is, but it, it, it is, as I hope everybody realizes that there, there probably are exceptions. But the, the the fact that if we think about the fact that 150 human beings, or whether it's 130 or 155, are being killed every day in China for their organs, it's just something that that should drive anybody that's doing business in China or that's going to China or studying in China uh, to. Uh, to do something and and we just can't let this go on it's been going on far too long and i i like to believe that we're getting to a tipping point where they've had so much bad publicity about it and they've had such feeble answers in reply in fact let me tell you because when we were first when our first study came out in 2000 way back in 2006 uh, we uh, the chinese embassy in, in ottawa put out a statement saying these dummies they they got Two of the cities in the wrong provinces. In effect, that's what they were saying. In other words, they couldn't they couldn't find any way of challenging any of our substantive stuff. So they found that in doing a map 
we put one city in the wrong province in China. So they said, you know, this is all I could find of substance. And frankly, it's never got, they've never got much better at it. They just come out with, we're anti-China. I mean, we're trying to save lives in China. We're trying, we're, we're, we're this, we're that. We're trying to save Uyghur lives, uh, Tibetan lives, uh, Falun Gong lives, uh, Christian lives. We're trying to save anybody in, in China who's a victim of conscience. And uh, I think this point is getting out. I, I hope you both have that impression too, that there've been, there's a story out uh, today that's uh, in the British Medical Journal that that I think will help. And I, I think there've been enough media and enough uh, serious people who look at this that uh, I, I think the intellectual argument is finished. The, the, the world, or at least the, the world that has an independent press knows that this terrible crime against humanity is continuing to happen in China, across China. Well, David, I'm curious, uh, Communist Party aside, what's been the response to your work? Well, it's it's interesting. I I, I ran into a, somebody the other day that, that uh, highly knowledgeable person of origin in China, and I sort of I gingerly approached her about and asked what she, what she thought, and she basically said that uh, she quickly switched the subject, and she said, well, you know, the the Falun Gong community, they're, they're not very credible. I don't believe that that's happening. So in other words, <laughs> and I, I, I can give you another story. The kind well, so of, how do you start a conversation to like to gently get into killing people for their organs? Like how does that conversation well, go? Well, it's, it's usually quite short because the other person's eyes sometimes glaze over rather quickly. But what I, what I said to her, as I said, you know, I, Hi, nice to meet you, and so on. I said, you. you uh, I gave her my card, and said, and she looked at it, and she saw the International Coalition to End Organ Abuse in China, and she quickly came back with, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's happening, or, or something to this effect. So then I we chatted about it for a few minutes, and then uh, she, uh, I don't know whether she ran away or she, <laughs> she, <laughs> the, the subject ended in any event, because a, a person of origin in China does not really want to hear that, you know, that her former the former government of where she lived is is killing uh, victims of conscience for their organs. It's a pretty horrible thought. Right, but on the plus side, if you're ever in like a really awkward social situation and you want to end a conversation quickly. <laughs> sorry, I know, sorry, forgive me, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> How dare you laugh about this, David? Uh, <laughs> I no, mean, no, I actually, it's, it's, I think it's pretty amazing that you can keep your sense of humor after decades of doing this. Well, you ha- you ha- honestly you have to, and I'm I'm Scottish origin too, and we Scots have you know we have good sense of humor about things. We we try to find humor even where there is none, and I'm sure that uh, I mean you guys do eat with. haggis. Oh, well, of course we eat haggis. It's the best food in the world. You know, I've always wanted that, to don't? try it. Oh no, it's delicious. Please do it on Robbie Burns Day whenever you can. It's 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 delicious, and and. and um, um, a lot of people don't like it. I agree with you, but but it is it is quite good. It's apparently very healthy too. <laughs> you know, in some ways, it's appropriate that we're talking about haggis on an organ harvesting episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I agree. I, I was just thinking that actually, but I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> well, to anyone who's listening who's offended, as David said, when you ha- you have to have a sense of humor about this. Well, so don't get mad. <laughs> I mean, if they they're listening to us, they probably know that we do this all the time. Hey, I so. don't know how the kids are finding us these days. That's true. You know, those kids and their experimental podcasts. Oh yeah, it's it's a it's a serious problem. Um, oh, Shelley. Oh, I was just going to ask David. So the person you talked to, she had heard of organ harvesting before. Oh yes, indeed she had, and I think she probably knew a lot more about it than she wanted to admit to me in a casual conversation. Well, so is uh, this kind of like, is that a common response you get to organ harvesting, like defensiveness? Well, I think it, I think it is, and it's actually imagine if, if one of you came had came, come from a country where this was happening. You, you you're, you're I, uh... deeply, sh- deeply <laughs> ashamed. Of Shelley is so, from China. <laughs> FYI. Oh well, then she, she knows better than anybody. So, so you, but you really you you want to believe that it's not happening. I, I know people do, and and so I I try to be you know understanding about it, and I don't let it ram it down people's throat. We had a in fact we had a seminar today at the. Uh, a forum at the McDonald's Laurier Institute in Ottawa, and it's a think tank. And we had a. Wait, sorry, had did a, you say the McDonald's Institute? So, sorry, the McDonald's yeah. Institute. It's called the McDonald Laurier Institute. They're, they're two of our best prime ministers, early prime ministers, 
and this is a think tank, and they had a okay. So I was just talk. imagining this being held at like a fast food restaurant. It, no, no, <laughs> okay. no. And somebody, and somebody, uh, a doctor got up and said he was, he was very eloquent. He said, "Listen, I, you know, I'm he's, he's a member of the coalition. Thank goodness, Dr. Barber." And he went on. He'd been a surgeon too, a transplant surgeon. And he went on about the fact that that a lot of people from Taiwan were going to, for organs to China, as everybody knows, I think. Are, and, and yet, all both parties agreed, and they passed the best legislation in the world to stop it from happening. And so uh, he got up and he, he paid great credit to the parliamentarians in Taiwan for doing this. But, but he um, he asked me afterwards whether many people, in, it was a packed room, whether he thought how many, how many people in the room knew about organ pillaging in China. And my guess would be that they were a very well-informed group that they probably all knew about it, although it, it didn't, he was the one who raised it, and it didn't, I didn't raise it in my comments, and the, uh, it, it wasn't raised prominently, but it's, but it is a, it is a reality that, that uh, the country, as you, I'm sure you realize, a lot of people from Taiwan were going because of hepatitis and so on. In fact, I, I, I often think of this, that the, the, man, the man that bothered me as much as anybody was a man who had gone from Taiwan to China uh, maybe 10 years ago now. And it, to make a long story short, they ended up bringing him eight sets of kidneys. And they, you know, they do this tissue testing and that sort of thing. And none of the eight sets would work. So he, he kept, they didn't actually put, try to put them into him. They just tested it in a vial or something. And, and they said, these won't work for you. And so, and so that's anyway, an unusual number sets, of kidneys? Oh, it's a t- I've never heard this many. And, and, and they, in fact, you went home to for three months to Taiwan, and then he came back again, and they gave him this four more, totaling eight. And the eighth set of kidneys worked. But the thing that that's so appalling about this is that eight human beings were killed for their uh, for, the, for their kidneys. Everyone knows you, you don't survive loss of both of your kidneys. So this got, man got, finally got two kidneys that worked, and eight human beings, and probably they were most, if not all of them, were prisoners of conscience. Um, uh, we're dead, and there was a military surgeon, Doctor Tan T A N, because I have his name, who uh, who was doing this stuff for him in the um, number one people's hospital in Shanghai. So I mean, this kind of thing just just you know makes your blood curdle to think this is happening in the in the twenty in the, today. Well, geez, I mean, now you touch on something I want to get into eventually. How how governments around the world are reacting to this, but I j- I just want to check. Now you've said that a lot of Chinese people that you've spoken to kind of uh, go on the defensive about this. What about mm-hmm. your average uh, non-Chinese person? Well, it, it depends. I, I sit on planes with people. I've sat on planes with, with a doctor, for, I remember one time, who knew nothing about it. And it was, you know, just completely he was unaware of it. And so uh, I think a lot of people choose to, you know, willfully not be aware of it because they they sort of don't want to believe it's happening, and, and we're we're all I think that's perfectly understandable human nature to to do this. But when you've had a when you've had a I think we found thirty five kinds of evidence that it was happening, and there've been a lot more since. And now we have this incredible thing that's happening to the Uyghur community in Xinjiang in the western China. I mean, a million people. In, in these terrible prisons, and it's, it's uh, as as I, I I quoted somebody the other day as saying that the only thing it compares with is the Holocaust is what's happening there, and yet where where are the uh, where are the world's leaders on this issue? Some of them have been terrific, but the vast majority of them have chosen to just kind of keep their mouths shut and hope that uh, you know hope that it'll, some, that it'll, it's not true. But it is it is true, and we all have a duty as human beings uh, wherever we live to. Uh, to speak up against this, and thank goodness a lot of people have spoken up against it, but still not enough, as you, as you, I'm sure you know. Do you think the average person knows about forced organ harvesting in China? Well, if you, I think if you look at the number, of course, the number of news articles that have been written, it's it's tens of thousands. I mean, there's actually there's, what, there's sort of one or two major news articles every day on it. It seems now. It's getting much better, I think. So I think there's a much level, high, higher level of awareness in all kinds of media. Uh, uh, so I, yeah, I think that, that people know. That, but uh, uh, still, there's a, there's a, I think it's about ten billion dollars a year the government of China is spending on propaganda to try to offset this kind of of, of news that's coming out. And so they uh, 
you know, they put out statements saying, oh, they, oh, maybe we were doing it before, but we all stopped it on January the 1st of 2015 and this kind of stuff. And that's only that's acknowledging true. that they did it from executed prisoners, not prisoners of conscience. Yes, they've never admitted that they do it to prisoners of conscience. You're absolutely right, Chris. And that's one of the things that just, just as a, a human being, it just drives me crazy that they can't even bring themselves to admit that they're, that they're doing it to innocent men and women. And, and as I can say, I think, to you, and I often say, is that where is the medical, where is the transplantation society on this? Where is the World Health Organization on this? Uh, well, I was going to say, where, it's it's in a weird twist. This propaganda must be working because the World Health Organization has been promoting China for organ transplantation. Uh, that seems like a decision they might regret one day. Well, I think so. And, and I think, as you all know, I won't mention any names, but the former head of the World Health Organization was from Hong Kong, and I had in my mind, this must is probably a connection between that and the and the we've we've discovered in talking with World Health Organization people over what, many years that we get very very little help from them. And I just again again, what planet are they living on? Oh, it's, it, it's it's hard it's hard to believe. You know, it, it just struck me like we just did an episode about how Microsoft is doing research with Chinese military universities. They're very likely being used in Xinjiang right now, where they are also potentially har- harvesting the organs of these Xinjiang Uyghurs. And it's just, it, it's, it's oh. shocking that these Western companies just don't, why are they doing this? Very good question. I wasn't aware of that. I'm, I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, yeah. Gee, well, you should watch more China Uncensored. <laughs> yes. No, I know I should. I, I, every time I do, I'm glad I did. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's true. It's, it's just... Uh, it's um, it's un, it's un, it's it's un, 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 unfathomable that this can be this can be happening and what you just described can be happening. Well, how much how much money do, do these companies have to make before somebody says maybe we should have a conscience in our or we should have some ethics in what we do? Well, Google specifically got rid of the "Don't be evil" part from their uh, company motto. Motto. So I think they have made the opposite decision. Yeah, I saw that. I'm I, yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that because yeah, it, yeah the, it, but it, it really it, frees it, them it, up, you know, to, to give them so many more options of how to make money. Oh, okay. well, well, yeah, it's, it's, so yeah, actually it, speaking of companies, there is a video clip that's going around on uh, social media of a reporter asking the CEO of uh, Volkswagen about whether they know about what's happening in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs being uh, locked up in these camps. And the CEO was like, oh, I I can't um, say anything about that. I'm not aware of it. And a lot of people were incensed. I've seen like China reporters um, just tweeting about how like, how can companies be like this? Like this has been in the news for months now. And my thought immediately was actually about organ harvesting uh, Mm -hmm. because that's been... You know, your first report came out in 2006, and I was kind mm-hmm. of like, my fear is that, you know, basically it would take years for companies to get called out about this kind of stuff because, you know, ha- has anybody gotten in trouble for, you know, helping promote organ transplants in China? Like, it seems that people have just been not really mentioning it for 13 years. Well, yes. But it's it is it's also true that a lot of people have mentioned it. I mentioned the doctor today at this gathering, and there were I suppose, well, maybe almost a hundred people that would have heard him uh, very eloquently tell them what's what's happening. Uh, and he mentioned the Uyghurs too. So I, I think that the, at some point, and I, I mean, I think the Congress, the House of Representatives, has been quite helpful. I think the European Parliament has the, uh, individual parliaments. The Czech Parliament just passed. Uh, Senate just passed a resolution last week. We have a bill in our uh, um, parliament, which is passed our Senate, and I hope it will pass the House uh, this uh, week or two that will make it much harder for Canadians to go to to China for organs. And so uh, it is, it is, there is progress being made slowly, but I, I couldn't agree more that uh, the, the companies that <laughs> that go to China and just sort of turn a blind eye to everything. It's 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 tragic. It's absolutely tragic. Well, since we're on the topic now, what have governments around the world done in response to uh, these findings? Well, they've done um, 
Some of them have done studies. Some of them won't do studies. Some of them, like we saw in the debate in the British Parliament recently, that the minister said that there wasn't enough proof or words to that effect. Well, there, there's a mountain of proof. It's just What he means is he just hasn't looked at any proof, and so it's easier to say there isn't enough proof than to say there is enough proof, but I'm not prepared to act on that proof. That's, that's what that... But that, uh, with that code language, wants to in my my main, and I'm delighted that people have uh, taken them to task on that. Well, I think but, the, the uh, challenge it, that you have with the proof is just that, like, in order to understand uh, organ harvesting and see that it's happening, you have to actually read a whole bunch of sort of smaller things that together clearly paint the picture, but. There isn't like a clear smoking gun video of this being done. Well, actually, there is a. We I call it a smoking scalpel. There is a smoking scalpel, and it actually arose in uh, the Uyghur part of uh, of China with uh, with um, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, oh, oh, yikes! He he's the surgeon. Remember the surgeon? Uh, he lives in London now. Yeah. Envertoti. Yeah, and Vertoti, forgive me. And uh, Toti is described in r- many places in great detail, just exactly how how the, he did take the heart out of a of a prisoner that had been shot in the wrong side of his chest to kill him. And and I mean, if that isn't a smoking uh, a smoking scalp, I don't know what is. Uh, and back then in we the had 90s, the thing, right? Yeah, that was back in the nineties. Yeah, so of course it's not happening was not, 90, anymore. Ninety five, I, I yeah. believe. Yeah. And I think we had this this Korean television station that went over, and I'm glad they're being heard from at this uh, independent tribunal in, in Britain too, because they had some pretty uh, some pretty solid evidence. But but you know we all watch too much television, and we're all used to seeing the bad guy or or woman uh, you know pull out a gun and shoot somebody. That 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 isn't the way uh, criminal trials work, or the way crime works. You often don't have uh, have uh, that kind of Cowboys <laughs> approach well, you, to, you to are, crime. You were a criminal prosecutor, so so how about you tell us a bit about like how that background has influenced your research into this? Well, it, it has in, in the sense that yes, it's, it's. Let me give you an example because we're 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 um, Annie, who remember who blew the whistle on this way back in two thousand and six. She and I spent a, I spent a lot of quite a lot of time with just her, for going people over listening. Can you give like a brief? Uh, Oh, yeah. okay. Annie is the, the the woman who gave the press conference in Washington and, and basically was the first one to blow the whistle and say, listen, people are being killed in Sujiatin, China, for their for their organs in large numbers. And she also went on later to say that her husband was a, it was a surgeon who was taking the corneas out of, I think it was 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners' eyes over a two-year period. And she... Uh, she, she told us, or she, it's in our report, that she basically he broke down. He was having nightmares, and finally, finally she got him to stop. And they both, they both uh, had been paid hundreds of thousands of U.S. dollars equivalent, and they both uh, finally left China. And they're now she, she's in the states, and actually he, he's in uh, in Canada. But I mean, it, it's true that. Here, the, old, the hearsay evidence rule that says that you're not supposed to hear her say this. You're supposed to hear him say this because he did those terrible operations. And yes, this is a, this is hearsay evidence which is not admissible in the court. I guess in the U.S. or in Canada or, or other places. But okay, that's one piece of evidence. But we've got, as I, as I said, we've got 30. If, even if you don't take her evidence as being admissible in court, we've got 35 other kinds of evidence. Um, um, Toady, for example, you know, and we've got his evidence. We've got the evidence of uh, people phoning to hospitals all across China and being told, and we've recorded the conversations and had them translated by independent interpreters and saying basically things like, we've got, oh, we can get you Falun Gong organs uh, if you come he- here to our hospital for these for these transplants. So at some point, uh, uh, any, I think, fair-minded person listening to this 35 kinds of evidence would, would say, yes, this is obviously happening, and it's, it's happening beyond any reasonable uh, proof that it's happening. But, uh, but there, most people we find are the people that are that accuse us of being, they accuse us of everything. We're stooges for the Falun Gong, we're stooges for this, we're stooges for that. They won't read the evidence, independent evidence that we've compiled as independent persons on a voluntary basis. They just choose to, to parrot the, you know, the party state line and, and make uh, statements uh, like 
you know, Matus and Kilgore are stooges for the Falun Gong. I mean, but there's fact, so many pages of evidence. It's you know, it's hard to expect people to just read so much. Well, they don't have to. Yes, that's true. But maybe I think like the World Medical Association or the Transplantation Society could maybe. And by the way, the Transplantation Society is based in Canada, in Montreal. Maybe they could ask one, one, uh, one doctor to sit down and read all of this stuff, and then somebody who has intellectual integrity, and maybe he or she could could read it for them if they haven't got the time to do it, and could maybe uh, give them some advice on that. I'm very happy to tell you that recently, uh, uh, in fact, the doctor, Dr. Barber, who was there today, and another doctor from Toronto, and I met with uh, with a member from the Canadian Medical Association, and we went over this, and I, I think we, we've had a real breakthrough with them. But it's, you know, you never know whether it's an article in a medical journal or whether it's a program on CNN or BBC or something that that, uh, that that opens somebody's eyes. But I think an awful lot of people's eyes are being opened these days, and, you're, and, and, and I believe this is going to have results. And then I give the Canadian bill as an example. We couldn't get that through Parliament for many years, but now it looks like I'm optimistic that the bill is going to pass uh, in the next couple of weeks, pass its final reading. It will be the law of Canada. Well, so let's go back to what uh, what governments around the world are doing. So that's something Canada has done. I, I know, I believe, Israel uh, was one of the first countries to ban organ uh, tourism. tourism to China. Yeah, Israel was definitely the, it's it's the, it's it was the first uh, one who did it. It was Dr. Jay Lavi, who's a heart surgeon, and as you probably all know very well, he uh, one day the penny finally dropped for him when one of his patients said, "I'm going to China for a heart," and Dr. Lavi said to him, "Well, when are you going for this heart operation?" And he said, "I'm going in three weeks," and then. Dr. Lavi, as a heart surgeon, realized exactly what was going to happen. The the, uh, the so-called donor was going to be going to be killed uh, in order that his patient could have a new heart. And that's and then when the guy came back from, I think it was a man, came back from China, he had a new heart. And, and Dr. Lavi was so incensed about this that he rallied the transplant profession and then the Knesset, and the, and the law was passed. And the and the, and Israel was one of the first to move on this. You know, I, I've heard uh, that story before, but I always wondered, like, did he tell that patient, like, what was going on? Like, what was his reaction? Well, I think he doesn't, he doesn't, he's, I guess his doctor patient privilege or something, he, does, he, he doesn't go into all the horrible details, but I, I think he was so offended that a patient of his would would, would do this, and, and uh, I, I suspect Dr. Levy tried to explain to him what was going to happen, but the guy went or the patient went anyway, and, and then uh, the result was that uh, it was that the, the this terrible situation stopped in, in Israel, and, and uh, thank goodness a number of other countries have done done similar things. Not always the same, but they've done similar things. Well, like what other countries? Well, it's um, Norway has done uh, taken some significant steps. Um, uh, Spain, I believe, is one of the leaders in kinds kinds of things they do. Uh, they they basically end organ tourism. I uh, you know this is a an example I, I often use is that I was in Australia once and uh, I better not name the province I might get this person into trouble, but but she told me that nobody was going from 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 her uh, state in in uh, Australia to, for organs uh, that is stopped, and uh, and uh, what had happened. Just so you know, is is that the, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation had put on a whole lot of broadcasts about this, and they talked to Ethan Gutman and the, I think David Mavis and myself, and and we they had really got it across to people in, in across Australia that this is what was happening. You know, somebody was going to be murdered so that you could have a new kidney, and uh, this, uh, thank goodness, it uh, bothered Australians enough that uh, at least from one state, and I hope all states, nobody goes. Uh, or, or extremely few, I uh, hope that means, you know, one or two, goes uh, goes from Australia now to China for organs. And uh, it's, um, it's um, so when, pub, when the people become aware of what actually is going on, they, uh, most of them will, will, uh, will change their, their policy, their, what, the, what they'll do and what they won't do. So what would you like to see governments do? Well, I'd like to see us all go the route of, of Taiwan and basically say that, look, if a, 
I'm, you know, I'm told, Chris, that there are actually brokers wandering around hospitals in some countries that sort of go up to hospital people in hospital beds and say, well, if you need a new organ, I can get you one. And then if they have enough money, which they, I guess uh, some do, then they uh, then they make they go through a broker and and uh, and a surgeon in a hospital in China, and then this person can go over there. But the so Taiwanese, like, let's, let's like, take a heart for for example. Like if you need a new heart. What would that mm-hmm. process be like for someone uh, in the West who who needs a new heart? Like in terms of how much it costs and what actually happens. Well, well, well the price seems to go go up and down. In effect, it looks like there, there were actually there were cheaper prices for organs for for Taiwanese than, than other countries. But let's suppose well, that's unfair. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's say that the. Uh, yeah, the price is is one hundred and sixty thousand U S dollars for a new heart, and I'm just using that as a hypothetical. But that's the kind of range we're we're talking about. At one point, they po- posted the prices on their websites, but of course, since all of this investigation stopped as, as started, they stopped that. So, if you come up with the cash, then then you you fly over, and it's it's amazing how many people from countries like uh, U S and Canada go to the, it's the number one people's hospital in Shanghai. Although they're now they're now. <laughs> Uh, 700 plus hospitals where these these organ transplants are being done. You you know you you check in and they they come and they do the tissue testing and the blood testing and so on and then and then the uh, then the the computer shows who's a match for for say you Chris and uh, some Don't poor guy out in work camp forced like labor his. camp by number number. Uh, we at one point we were convinced there were at least 350 of them. There may be more now. There may be less, but. Some poor guy is dragged out of a dormitory uh, where he's with 16 other people. And we've talked to people who've got out of these terrible work camps. And then he's given some, I think it's potassium they're giving them now. And then his heart is removed. It's flown to you in Shanghai on the, by the People's Liberation Army airplane. And you're given a new heart. And you come back to, uh, to New York, if that's where you are, and, and you've, got a, you've got a new heart. And somebody's been basically murdered so that you could have... Oops, you could have a new, you could have a new heart. I'd say that's heartless, but yeah, technically yeah, it's, 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 it's not. Well, I know over the past couple of years, the the scale of transplantation in China has exploded. They've been building, uh, like not just average hospitals doing more transplantation, but they've been building mega hospitals devoted to transplantation at a time yep. when they have no yep. explanation of where they're getting the organs. Yep. Oh, they come up, you've probably seen them, they, they talk about need for humor, they come up with the most in, in crazy stories you've ever seen. <laughs> and you, you'd have to be dumb, like what? dumb, dumb. Well, what, what they do is they say now that they're persuading patients who are terminally ill to donate their organs. And well, you can imagine how they decide who's terminally ill. You've got a scratch on your wrist, so you're terminally ill. And <laughs> this, yeah. I mean, this is when you, when you don't have ethics in the, in the medical profession or in the government or anything this this is the kind of thing that can happen so that, so that uh, this is why i'm so terrified about what's happened to the uyghurs is that that these are people that are as, as you probably all read is that they're being uh, they're being treated they're being treated well like the holocaust so do you think anybody's going to worry about taking a taking an organ from a healthy man a uyghur man or woman who's who's uh, one of these terrible hospitals and the, and uh, I don't think it would slow them up for a nanosecond. The the, the the inhumanity of what they're doing. So this is a this is a whole new market for them. They've got if they've got, and I'm told that a great many of these people and these million people or whatever the number is now are DNA tested, and uh, that just then becomes you get instead of going to a forced labor camp, you go to one of these hospitals and they find the the poor victim donor in in, in those hospitals. Jeez, and it's, hey. it's uh, Guess what we just found out on that episode we did about Microsoft and uh, working with yeah. Chinese military universities? We found out right. about a Yale professor who was uh, directly giving DNA samples to the Ministry of Public Security. No. Yeah. And there was another case of who was selling DNA Thermo samplers? Thermo Fisher, was it? Thermo Fisher was selling uh DNA sequencers, I believe, to directly to the in Xinjiang, Xinjiang, Xinjiang until earlier this year. Oh, 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 oh. it's it's uh, it's just awful. It's 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 unspeakable. Would you say? And so, that... what happened to the what happened to the Yale professor? By the way, 
Uh, I think it. He was like, I didn't know. I didn't know what they were doing it for. It's like you know, if you're a Yale professor, you should be smart enough to know what working with the Ministry of Public Security in an authoritarian regime means. But so he kind of mm-hmm. played dumb and like no longer does it. But so, David, are there some red flags that? I mean, in your research, you've seen the pattern of what happened with the Falun Gong uh, practitioners and uh, the Tibetans and, and uh, Christians and, like, Uyghurs in the 90s. Are there some red flags about what's happening with the Uyghurs now? Oh, well, well, yes, there is. People who do studies on genocide have, and I'm sure you've all seen these too, they, they point out that there's, there are levels. The first thing you do is you, you, uh, you start to criticize. That's exactly what happened to Falun Gong. Then you, you start to, well, there, there's eight stages to it. You know, you dehumanize them, and then you you make them propaganda. It, it, and I gather the propaganda across China and the media, state media is, is 24-7, to the point where, where I often tell the story that, that a friend of mine was in Tiananmen Square a few, a few years ago with her mother, and uh, their guide uh, was with them, and when the, the Falun Gong came up, and, and the guide said, oh, the Falun Gong, oh, they eat their children, don't they? So that's what happens when you have to demonize and then dehumanize people to the point where, where people will say, oh, well, maybe you should take their organs. They're, they're horrible. They're horrible people. And that's, of course, what happened in Rwanda during the genocide there. It's what happened in Nazi Germany. It's, and it's what's happening today in China to the, to the Falun Gong. And I am very much believe the Uyghur community and to Tibetans. It's, so, it's, so you uh, criticize, you dehumanize, you demonize. That's only like three yeah. steps out of eight. I mean, I'm not taking notes well, or anything, but I'm just like, how? Yeah. What else do we see? Well, well, it's um, it's it's pretty. The distinctions get pretty narrow. But I mean, I've, I've sat in lectures where somebody's gone through, the, say, the history of what happened to the the Tutsi community in Rwanda, and they they basically end up at the eighth level where they said Tutsis are cockroaches. So you can you know what you do to a cockroach, and that's what happened when was it eight hundred thousand Tutsis were were murdered in a in a four month period. So that, that's what these. That's amazing that's how these, effective some of this uh, this propaganda is. Like I have in front of me a uh, a quote from the former Norwegian MP. Uh, this is recent. Get this. He he said. The U.S. has twisted an economic success story into a narrative about a race for world domination. It criticizes Chinese detention camps for Muslims, which are intended to protect against terrorism. That's a yeah, former Norwegian yeah, I, MP. Yeah, I, uh, I. you wonder how people can be so stupid, don't you? Especially MPs, when they're yeah. supposed to know better. And yeah. Well, there's one former well, MP that knows better. Well... Yeah, well, no, no, there are a lot of MPs. I'm actually encouraged by how many uh, how many MPs are in doc- It's it, What we've discovered is you've got to get the doctors on side, and then the doctors, they can get the surgeons on side, and then and then they, they quickly, once that happens, they can quickly get the the, local, the MPs on side. For Does it help you local. being a former parliament member to, like, have that, that street cred, I guess? Well, no, I expect I... I was saying to you earlier that it's really it's the fact that I was a prosecutor and that the people I think they may not like prosecutors but they know that we're fair that we we don't well I hope they know we're fair that we don't charge somebody with with uh, with a crime unless the, there's a, a, a lot of evidence available and that you know and that the evidence is admissible and that the evidence is, if, if accepted by a jury would would result in a, in a guilt probably result in a guilty plea so we we don't uh, we don't charge people frivolously. So David, you're basically a lawyer chasing an ambulance for the right reasons. <laughs> chasing an ambulance for the right reasons. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Only you could do that. Chris. Well, yeah, yeah, we're 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 trying. <laughs> uh, I'm not supposed to laugh. That's not funny. that's not supposed to be funny, but it's funny. Okay, well, well um, yeah, we're trying to we're trying to stop mass murder is what we're trying to do and and you are and everyone else who I hope watching your program and goes out and and uh, talks to their member of Congress is trying to do the same thing. Well, it's, that's a good point. Simply, We've talked about what governments can do. What can the average person do? They can do a lot. They uh, they can, um, I mean, what they did, they started a, a coalition against human trafficking here in Ottawa, for example, a community group, yeah, mostly young people. And when you get young people behind something like this, or students and whatnot, it's, it's, it makes a huge difference. So we now have a, in Ottawa, we have a very active, coalition they're fighting you know forced labor 
uh, fighting hu- human organ tra- transplants, and, and uh, they're acting on many fronts. But, and that's uh, something anyone uh, around the world can join? Of course, anybody can start their own. Uh, they, they can just look up the, the Google, the, called the, it's called the, uh, the Ottawa Coalition Against uh, Human Trafficking, or just uh, Ottawa Human Trafficking would probably come up very quickly on Google, and you can see what they've done, and, they, and they're really... Uh, they're trying to do a lot, and this has now become one of their their focuses is is, is organ trafficking, and, and I'm delighted to hear that. I wish we could get groups going like that in every major city or small city. Well, that's a that's one way they can go after their their of course a member of Congress or the MP, and and they can go after they can after go after the the members of the assemblies in the states because they have health jurisdiction and, and they could probably do something at the state level. And some of the states have passed resolutions. I don't know how many of them have passed laws to, to bar people from, from uh, using uh, transplant tourism. But I, I guess, because some people say, you know, it's criminal and therefore it has to be the federal government or the national government. And others say, well, you can do it at the state level. Well, do whatever is, is within the jurisdiction of the state if you're at the state level and go to the federal level if you're at the same the federal level but do something just you know just go and have an appointment with your member of congress and tell him or her what what's uh, what's going on you can you can get if you go on our international coalition website you can you can you know you give them the give them the um, the website and they they'll find that they'll find an awful lot of information on that do you have access to that i'm sure don't you that international coalition website uh yeah we can Put a link in the YouTube description. Can you say what the website is? Well, sure. Well, one one way of doing it, I I, I often do it is, is it's 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 called ETAC. But you just if you just go uh, www david david dash kilgore k i l g o u r dot com, the the we, the link to the website for the coalition comes up right at the top of of my website, and you can go directly to there from the, the top it's the top li- link at the on the website. And then once you get in there, as I'm sure you know, there's just a, a huge amount of stuff that's that's very, very carefully done, and not to waste anybody's time. And it's it's I think it's very compelling, uh, persuasive stuff. And if, you know, if people want somebody wants to sign a petition, they can do that. If they want to start a get a speaker to come to their, their town or city or village, uh, that will we can probably do that. They could maybe start a chapter in the city. There, there are just a million things that we can, that people can do, deporting to what their situ- own situation is. So, David, I'm curious how you got started with researching organ harvesting. Well, it it was the Pilot Gong community used to come and see me in in in, in the constituency office in Edmonton, and, and then here in Ottawa, and I I was getting increasingly concerned by by what they were what they were telling me. This and, is when uh, you're an MP. You know, this is when I was the Secretary of State for, okay. well, I guess Africa, and then later for Asia Pacific. So we were going on these trade missions to China. Can you imagine? <laughs> and I'm going over there thinking, what on earth is going on here? And but as you can imagine, I wasn't exactly allowed to go off and <laughs> conduct my own. In fact, I'm very glad I didn't because as as Edward McMillan Scott discovered, he went over to China and he started asking questions about this. And one of the people he talked to. Uh, um, a Falun Gong practitioner there had disappeared and was never seen from again. And, and McMillan Scott, who was a former member of the European Parliament, was terrified that by talking to him, he had exposed this person to a terrible danger. And then the letter from Masenjai, which I hope you've all seen, I'm sure you have all seen that m- wonderful movie. Yeah, I've seen that uh, movie. It's, Anyone it's listening, an check out A Letter from Masenjai. It's just it's one of the most moving movies I've seen, <laughs> and as films I've seen, and, and it, I mean there that just lays it all out so well, <laughs> and uh, and yet um, so so yeah so one thing kind of led to another, and when I didn't run in two thousand and six in the election, uh, uh, to, uh, Matus and I were asked to look into this matter. And we thought it was going to last a few months, <laughs> and little did we know we'd still be doing it. Uh, uh, what? How many years? Well, it is 2006. 13 years. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah, so, but we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going with this, like I hope everybody is, until uh, this terrible thing happens, stops. And I think it is going to stop. I think they're getting so much bad publicity that uh, that uh, and, and you know how can you trade with a country that kills its own people for their for their vital organs? <laughs> well, there's a good answer for that. They have lots of money. Such a big market. 
I, I, of course it is. But at some point, human beings, in my experience, will, will say that is simply not going to continue. I know, and but if the, it were like Burkina Faso that were killing people for organs, people would be like, oh, well, we're just not going to trade with them. Right? But the mm-hmm. fact that it's China, it's like, well, like, yeah, they're killing people for organs, but there's like a billion potential consumers. Oh, well, I don't think it goes there. I think what they do is they just say, I don't believe they're killing people for organs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I've heard that so many times. And I remember going to a foreign ministry and, and uh, with David Mavis and the two of us agreed that, that, uh, that we would not try to, you know, try to uh, get too excited. We'd be calm. We'd be careful. We'd be say, well, have you read this? Would you read this, please? And of course, we, we knew what the game was being played. Is that this this guy just he was the China desk, of course, and he just didn't want uh, he didn't want anything to be said that would uh, might be cause him to have to do something differently. And uh, fortunately, things change, and in the country, I'm thinking that things are changing quite quickly. And uh, in fact, uh, it was Australia, so I'm I'm really pleased how quickly things are changing. Have you ever been told outright that they just can't touch this issue? Like either from like a yes, government or a fact, media. In fact, that's. I'm glad you raised that, Shelley. I was told that by Amnesty International. And really? I, no, that was in the, yeah, that was in in because Amnesty was one of the first places we went in in the Empire State Building in New York City, as you know. And we uh, we um, well, then we went to London. Their head office is in London, as as, as, as everybody knows. And we went to them very quickly, uh, and they. Uh, Finally, because we wondered why we couldn't get anywhere with them, why they wouldn't take it up, and they kept saying we need independent observation. Well, how are you going to find an independent observer saying that there's an operation going on in this hospital room and somebody's being killed for their organs? So finally, finally, somebody told us, I won't mention his name, but I, I believe him. He said, look, we felt that if we took up this issue, it would, it would hurt our capacity to get them to stop capital punishment in China. So for about seven or eight years, we... We went through a lot of problems with amnesty, but I'm happy to tell you that the uh, amnesty is now on side. I won't say that they're one of our one of the best advocates for this issue, but at least they're not going around saying to people that they don't have enough evidence because they have a mountain of evidence, and so they they don't try to they don't try to say that. And I'm, I'm a supporter of amnesty, but on this issue that they for seven or eight years they were they were they really let the side down. Wow, that's very disappointing to hear. Mm-hmm. David, in your research, is it still is organ harvesting still happening at the level that it was when you were still looking in first looking into this? Oh, it's I think it's far far greater now. All of our charts, if you look at our at our update in 2016, you'll see that the number of hospitals doing it, the number of beds that are being available, and the number of surgeons that are being trained and nurses, and all these things are are all. Uh, escalating rapidly so no the, the trend is all in the wrong direction if that'd be might do much better if it was going down but no it's, it's clearly going up and we we lay all that out with charts and all kinds of things and we, and we have I'm not sure i think we have 2400 footnotes in our update so it's we know that if we get one tiny little detail wrong somebody's going to say you see you got this wrong so we, we know we have to be precise and very careful on everything we say and our, our update is is that way I, so, I think nobody has ever, ever challenged any factual matters in, in the update, to my knowledge. So in the time that the international community has really not done enough, the situation has not just stayed the same. It's accelerated. It's gotten worse. Absolutely, yeah. It's, 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 well, we, it's, we figured it's bringing in about, what was the estimate? Was, was it 8 or $9 billion are coming into China from organs? From, from you know the pilots get paid the nurses get paid the surgeons the the police the hospitals everybody gets paid so it's, it's a huge amount of money that's, that's coming into the system so the medical system because of this um, this this bile industry that they're running wow well, I think I know how I can pay off my student loan debt that was a little dark yes. <laughs> student loans <laughs> yeah. are dark I mean I know how you felt yeah. this, this whole time I've been thinking about like organ harvesting jokes and then Mostly not saying them. <laughs> Thank yeah, you for your response. They're probably better left unsaid, aren't they? <laughs> Thank I you, mean, David. It, we were, we did that China Uncensored episode uh, about mm-hmm. the tribunal that was held in London, and uh, like for us, is because we're always trying to make jokes. So the challenge is, you know, coming up with jokes that are, like, I guess, um, 
the correct type of joke, right? Because like you don't want to make a joke about a serious thing that's happening, but you do need to make mm-hmm. jokes. So like, how do you kind of? Shelly came to, up with some good some good punchlines. You need to make it a little more palatable for people, I right. guess. Yeah, we're not making jokes yeah, it's true. for the sake of jokes. It's that's, to it, it's, get you, I couldn't watch. agree with you more, Shelly. You've got to somehow you've got to suddenly have a sweetener a sweetener in the sense of getting someone so they'll listen to you, and then you can you can make your points and then and then ask them to do something and uh, and uh, i'm surprised how many people go away and 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 uh, like this again to go keep going back to this doctor today he went and he talked to something like 30 or 40 of his uh, the surgical friends and he said uh, not many of them would do anything but boy is he ever he's made a, he's become a real uh, a real crusader for this and he's that's great he's really going after the going after the medical profession and uh and that's that's the key. Uh, please always try to get some from the, from the medical profession on the side because they can they can do a huge amount. So inside China, it's gotten worse, but internationally, things are getting better. Mm-hmm. Well, I yes, think I is, think so. Well, then I think this is a great opportunity for everyone listening to you know take David's advice and actually contact their representatives or try and create their own coalitions like this is the time to take action because it's only going to get worse if people continue to do nothing absolutely so David thank you for all your great work if somebody wants to learn more about you or what you do where should they go well yeah the website works pretty well and there is a there is a way you can communicate with it I I am uh, I am um, Actually, the way the best way of doing it, it would be to go to the ETAC, the International Coalition Against Organ Transplant Abuse in China, and you can link to that uh, very easily uh, at, at the just going through. They go to, go through my website if they like it. If they, okay. or if they don't want to try to look up ETAC, it I, I you do have the, the way to access it very quickly. Yeah, and do you have a Twitter handle you might want to? Share with no, us. I don't use Twitter. I use Facebook, but I'm, I'm at my name. limit, unfortunately. 5,000 friends, so I can't take any more. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, no, I don't use Twitter. I I gave I tried it when an MP, and it, after three months, I think I was ready to pull all my hair out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the website is www.david-kilgore.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Kilgore. but Kilgore in the U.S. is spelled O-R-E, but in, in Canada it's spelled, in, Sc- in Scotland it's spelled O-U-R. <laughs> So that, K-I-L-G-O-U-R. G-O-U-R. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. No, no, no thank you. Thank all of you for doing it. I much, much enjoyed it. <laughs> bye, bye for now. All right. Bye, David. Bye, thank bye, you. Bye. Well, so how are you guys feeling after that? I am uh, well, genuinely shocked about the Amnesty International thing and a little bit more cynical about the world. I'm actually feeling good that after... You know, so many years, there are at least a number of groups that are really trying to, you know, raise awareness and make a difference. Uh, ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the one where they interviewed you last year mm-hmm. about Xi Jinping becoming presentator. Uh, they Was actually, that only a year ago? It's only a year ago. A year ago. But uh, so, like, as as David Kilgore said, like, they're actually, you know, That's broadcasting true. Okay. some stuff. So this is, this is good. There is legitimately some progress on this yeah yeah i guess like i see like people frustrated that the weaker issue isn't getting more play after only a few months of being publicized and i'm like well as somebody who's been looking at human rights stuff in china you know almost since i was like six years old like yeah i mean (laughs) the fallen gong have been trying to get their story out for two decades yeah everybody forgot about Tiananmen Square like it's been going on for a long time your first political protest was actually a Tiananmen Square protest right yeah so it's you know it's it's these things take a long time so I don't know I feel like now now is the time and so I, I really would say to anyone listening like this is something you can make an impact on you don't have to host a hilarious China podcast one of the best China podcasts in the world Top three alphabetically. You don't have to host a YouTube channel. You don't have to be a you know former Canadian MP and do you know in depth research. Like you can do something. You know, call your representative, start a group, tell someone. I mean, I the telling someone thing I think is pretty important, and like yeah. everybody can do that. I'm just imagining David Kilgore like every time he flies somewhere, which is 
presumably like a dozen times a year, like just sitting next to someone on a plane being like, hey, by the way, like there's this thing happening in China. Did you know? I mean, I feel like that happens to me constantly. I'll be at a party and suddenly I'm talking about like Chinese human rights abuses to somebody I just met. You are lots of fun at parties. Shelley. I'm great at parties. And the crazy thing about this is is one of the people, one of the few people who have actually been speaking about this for years has been Alex Jones. Please don't let Alex Jones be the main voice of this. <laughs> you know, I don't think that helps the credibility thing that David Kilgore was talking exactly. about. Exactly. <laughs> so please, loyal listeners, take up the mantle to arms. Uh, All right. And, and, it, and if you if you don't know what to do, I think the, the website that David Kilgore mentioned, we've put a link to it on the version that's on YouTube of this uh, podcast. Um, they have a lot of resources and things like that to get you started. We need a better website. It unifies all of our things. Hey, Matt, I have one more thing for us to add to our list of things to do. Oh, put, put links to all the things on our website. Uh, totally revamp the website. Yes. All, all the things. What would we call it? The world the uncensored. China America Uns- un- America did- China did- unscriptable. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. And thank you to everyone listening. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Canesta. We'll talk to you next time. And don't forget to leave us a good review on iTunes. And do something about organ harvesting, you lazy, no good no good Nick. Boy, Chris, you should be a motivational speaker. (laughs)